Both of Alexander and some of Hercules, of Hector and Lysander, and such great names as these. But of all... Hello and welcome to this Battle Mech discussion. Today we're going to cover the Giliotine. 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 Which is the classic SLDF workhorse heavy mech, which has been in production, well, since the late 25th century and has been in use by just about everybody, just not in as big a number as some of the other mechs that are more frequently seen. It's both price range and weight range. The guillotine falls into that category of early heavy mechs. Not as early as, let's say, the Thunderbolt or the Orion that we have here, but in the same particular group here, before there were a lot of advancements and before there was a lot of refinements. Companies were trying to get that heavy mech concept down at the time, and were trying to get something combat ready that people could buy and make a hefty profit off of it. Heavy mechs were meant to replace the main battle tanks from the SLDF and all the other member states. Well, this was a little bit before the SLDF, so it was the mech that was going to be your standard in combat. While assault mechs like the Mackie, of course, they're great, but the heavy mech would have been a little bit more flexible, a little bit faster, just a little bit more of what you need to have in larger quantities to have a mainstay force. The first heavy mech was the Orion, which was released in 2456. It was a really early mech, but it did put down the concept of heavy mech down with something with fairly heavy armor, not terribly fast, but usually faster than your assault mechs that was able to do a little bit of everything. The actual role of the heavy mech was not well defined. Things were still being experimented on and mechs coming out at the time were trying different things. The Orion stuck around, the Thunderbolt stuck around, but some of the others just disappeared in the annals of history, basically. So what is the guillotine? Well, it's a workhorse machine, like I was saying. So it's meant to be your frontline trooper and to be produced in large amounts and deployed in large amounts. So the GLT-3N series was a great choice at the time. It's mostly made off of off-the-shelf parts. There's nothing super fancy about it, except that the skeleton was made in fancy endo steel. So it's a bit more expensive and a bit more complicated to manufacture. But for uh, the Terran hegemony, that was not a problem as they had the facilities to do that. And it has case ammo storage for its ammo, which is overall a very simple concept, but one that was not... Uh, kept in people's mind as much as uh, just sticking the ammo somewhere. It's also built around the Vox 280 power plant, which is a fairly common model. At the time, probably not as much, but nowadays it's the kind of engine that you can find just about anywhere by kicking a uh, fusion power plant trash can. And it allows it to go about 65 kilometers per hour on level ground. And even if the ground's not level, well, it's got four jump jets, so it can poof in and out fairly quickly. You've got 12 tons of armor, which is pretty decent. If you remember, the uh, Victor has less armor than that and is an assault mech. And the Hunchback is a bit 20 tons lighter and has only two tons of armor less. So it's in that nice soft spot here. Not fully covered, but mostly covered with armor. At the time of deployment, an original... Uh, production it was fast and mobile nowadays it's not incredible because with xl engine xxl engines and all those fancy things including improved jump jets it might not be great but it's still a very capable cavalry commander and knife fighter especially if you've got a variety of other mechs to uh, surround it with there's quite a few mechs in the 80 kilometers per hour range that would be fairly well commanded by it you've got a lot of mechs that are a bit slower that it could be a part of a lance for so it's honestly a good choice for many different roles in frontline combat well you some people would say that the guillotine's weaponry is kind of light we're talking about a sunglow large laser four medium lasers two in the arm mount two in the torsos no hands so it can't punch 
still can still kick, so that's okay. And a six rack SRM system in the center torso, which allows it to hit weakened armor spot and potentially do some critical damage. That does not look like a super heavy setup. What it does have, however, is 25 standard heat sinks. That makes it really easy to maintain and really easy to replace. You don't have to fight to find parts for it most of the time. And it keeps the mech really, really cool. I mean, you can shoot everything and jump around and you'll only start seeing the engine temperature goes up just a little bit. So if you start managing what you're doing, you're not even going to get into that uh, red zone at any point. Unless, of course, you're facing things with infernos and flamers and things that could set you on fire. If you remain cool, you can shoot pretty much everything, which makes this mech maybe lighter armed than some of the other heavy mechs in its category, but more reliable at the same time. So let's talk about the competition and the things that came around the same date. Well, the first thing we need to look at is what was going on before Battle Mech. Here we have a Marston MBT, which was the standard main battle tank for most of the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces until Battle Mech basically planted them. There were other MBTs at the time, the Tiger for the Federated Sons, as an example. All of them were a little bit different one to the other. But I'll go with the Martson here as the most standard MBT of the era. It had 15.5 tons of armor. It varied depending on what kind of armor was available at the time as battle mech were introduced with a new type of armor. So that replaced some of the armor on those tanks while they were still being produced. It's meant to be tougher. But since it's a tank, it is actually more fragile because just the format of the tank makes it easier to disable the tracks, hit the ammo bins, etc. So you always have to worry about that. It's also slower than the guillotine at around 54 kilometers per hour in a straight line. And of course, as a tank, it can't jump because it's not a Kanga. It is still fairly lightly armed as well. It has a five class auto cannon in the turret. 12 tombs of SRMs in the front and a pair of machine guns to take care of infantry. I would say at that point that it's lighter armed than the guillotine, but it does have some anti-infantry capabilities which the guillotine doesn't have. Next up, we're gonna look at the, well, not the original Orion, but the main production Orion in the early stages. The Orion being the first heavy mech, there were a few different varieties of it, but this one is the one that was produced in larger amounts and sold in bigger amounts than any others until the modern version. It can go 54 kilometers per hour, so it's equivalent to that Marston we were just talking about, and it could keep up with the Mackie it was supposed to import. It packs a 10-class auto cannon. This was originally a prototype version, so it was not super reliable, but it worked. It had two racks of uh, five tube LRM launchers, a pair of medium lasers, and a four rack SRM. But add weapons for all range brackets. It could shoot a little bit further than your guillotine with the LRM racks. It had that mid range capability with the AC 10, and the medium laser and SRMs, well, are comparable to what you have on your guillotine. It can't jump, it's a bit clunkier because it's older tech. And it has 21 tons of armor, but it's the primitive kind. So overall, it only has a slight bit more armor protection than the guillotine would. If you compare a modern Orion to the guillotine, it's a little bit of a different ball game. But this is the one that you were able to buy at the time. It also featured not enough heat sink. So if you started shooting what you add in the quick succession, you are going to cook yourself death. So your mileage may vary on the Orion. I would go with, an er with the modern model before that early model in every case. We are then brought up to the 5S Thunderbolt, which is your basic frontline heavy mech. It was literally built as that. I think one of it, its advantages over the guillotine is the fact that it does have hands, so it can be used in other situations than just combat and when it gets into combat and it gets into punching range well 
it can punch. It has actually more armor than the guillotine would, and a very good chunk of weapon, a large laser, three medium lasers, a pair of machine guns for infantry, an LRM-15 rack for long-range combat, and an SRM-2 rack for crit seeking. So it's a very big range of weapon, but I still think it's fairly comparable to the guillotine, and that 15 rack LRM is uh, giving you a good long-range punch. One of the big problems, though, is that you only are running 15 sinks. So uh, I hope you like sweating and all that ammo you're carrying for those machine guns, those LRMs and those SRMs will just go up in flame if you start uh, shooting everything all the time. So it's a mech where you need to think a lot more when you're fighting. House Davion tried to heavy mechs before they settled with uh, what we'll see later. They built the Battle Axe and the Amaranth in fairly quick succession, and they were ideas that they iterated on. The Battle Axe was just as mobile as the Guillotine, but people kind of hated the jump jets that were on it, and a lot of pilots had them either disabled or completely removed and added weapons instead. The Amaranth, on the other hand, is slower. It uh, only goes around 50 kilometers an hour, comparable to those named the we were talking about earlier. Battle Axe is a long-range support mech. It's got a pair of PPCs and a three to four racks of LRMs. Small LRMs, LRM5s. While the Amaranth is a medium-range brawler with two AC-10s, which doesn't generate to that much heat, so it evens out a little bit. Both of them have lighter armor than the guillotine, and their attempts that were not kept into production, basically. Neither of them, I think, are terrible mechs. Both of them can be used in quite a variety of scenarios. They just were supplanted by better mechs with larger production base. House Liao, at the same time, decided to go with the Fast Heavy, which is always a gamble. Let's be honest. If you're going with a Fast Heavy, that means that you're going to put a very big engine in and very big engines it's very heavy it has as much armor as the guillotine this uh koshe koshi not quite sure you're supposed to pronounce it ksc series and its weaponry is one large bore ac10 and a pair of mean lasers You've got the same range as the guillotine as that ac10 and a large laser is pretty much equivalent and two medium lasers so you've got the same range there but on the guillotine, well, you get two extra medium lasers and an SRM-6, and you can jump. I think the ability to jump is more important than going a little bit faster in that era of battle mech development, because at that point, you didn't have anything fancy for the engines that would allow you to save space. It was a trade-off, and the Koshe basically disappeared as about as quickly as it was developed as other heavy mechs were superior and now we get to basically the standard 70 ton heavy mech which is the warhammer whm series from starcore new art who was building this guillotine at the time probably panicked when they saw this thing get into production and starting to be sold because it was basically an owl rounder it, that did everything well enough and that could be produced in large enough amounts that everybody was going to buy it. It's a little bit different from the guillotine because it is set up more as that all rounder kind of mech. It's got a pair of PPCs, a pair of medium lasers, a pair of small lasers, a pair of machine guns, and a six rack SRM. It has less armor than the guillotine, it doesn't jump and it has a tendency to run fairly hot. So would I buy Warhammers before Guillotine? Well, it really depends on what's available at, for me at the time. The Warhammer does have that all-rounder feel to it, and there's quite a few refits of it that are fairly interesting, and it does feature anti-infantry capabilities, which the Guillotine doesn't have. Honestly, if I were to build a force, Buying a set of Warhammer and buying a set of guillotines wouldn't be a bad idea. It would just be a complementary idea.
Of course, during the Succession War, all the fancy equipment that was required to build the guillotine kind of went out the window. Endo Steel went first because nukes are a great way to make sure people don't build things, and then the case system was kind of set aside. It didn't impact the guillotine all that much in their production lines much. And there were two main variants at the time, which were available throughout the uh, long darkness of the Succession Wars. The 4L series is the one you're most likely to have seen running around. Some people will rebuild them to modern standard as soon as they can. All it really features is three less heat sinks. It means the guillotine runs a little bit otter you do have to be a little bit more careful with what you're shooting but three heat sinks that's basically one medium laser be fired so if you're careful with what you're shooting you should be fine there's also the 4p version also known as the discount warhammer you replace the large laser with a ppc for the cost of a, a little bit of armor not a bad design and the kind of thing that you would see people do as a standard off the rack refit as well both of them common enough that you will uh, see them run around the 4L being a common one. When the Elms Corps and the NICE started uh, moving science forward again, we were given the 5M series of guillotine. The advantage was that the uh, 5N series, you know, the original one, the 3N series, I mean, we still had the plans for it, just not the equipment to do it. When you started getting endo steel again, well, you start putting that back together. The main thing that has changed afterwards is that you replace the large laser with an ER, large laser, so you've got longer range on it, but it generates more heat. You do have to be a lot more careful with what you're shooting when you're in 5M. Now we're going to look at some of those that are actually harder to buy or even find. Word of Blake and Comguard add quite a few guillotine available that they inherited when they got some of the SLDF caches. What the Word of Blake did with their guillotine was to make the pilot not very comfortable. They stuck a small cockpit in. Those are about a third lighter than a standard cockpit and feature less life support <laughs> capabilities and only has 12 double, uh, 11 double heat sinks actually. So it uh, runs much odder. It has the fancy armor, it has the C3i computer, which is standard in most World of Blake battle mechs, and it uses a compact gyro. We're starting to see something that's built very different there. As far as weaponry goes, you've got an heavy PPC, so you've got the range of a regular PPC, but the punch of a clan ER PPC. A 15 rack LRM, or additional long range support and four ER medium lasers for mid-range support. It's stupidly expensive, but in the end, you're not going to be able to buy any of those because the Word of Blake is not selling them, and most of the Word of Blake equipment has been destroyed. House Merrick, on the other hand, went with what some people call a minor evolution, but I like to call these people wrong. It has an ER PPC. It's a standard inner sphere one with a ppc capacitor so you can uh, overcharge it against a bit of a temperature rise you get a pair of light ppcs and a pair of er medium lasers this is also uh, featuring a streak six rack of srm which are far more accurate than regular SRM. this gives you a much heavier punch than the standard guillotine especially at a longer range with all those ppcs you get 16 double heat sink and a case two system to protect your ammo. So it's fairly safe for the pilot. It's still gonna run odd because those light PPCs do run odder than standard medium lasers. ER medium lasers run odder than regular medium lasers. And that ER PPC with a capacitor can basically boil you alive if you overcharge it. But still, <laughs> in the end, it's a very nice long range support unit rather than a knife fighter and you can use it as a cavalry support unit rather than maybe a cavalry commander because it's not going to go in front. House Davion in 3062 went with the smartest, simplest upgrade kit. All lasers are replaced with ER version, so ER large, 4 ER medium, a streak 6 rack 
and all the lasers are linked on an advanced targeting computer. What they do to save some of that weight is to put double heat sinks in instead of the regular heat sinks. You are going to run otter because all those extended range lasers do generate quite a bit of heat, but you get that extra bit of range. And with that targeting computer, you're going to be hitting things fairly well. As with most SLDF mechs, well, the clans did have quite a few of them laying around. What they did here was actually go full on refit and create the guillotine 2C, which is a rather fantastic piece of hardware. It uses ferrofibrous armor, the standard endo steel chassis that we had on the original guillotine, but since it's using clan space magic, it doesn't take it up as much room, and it has the same standard performances, around 65 kilometers per hour, able to jump around 120 meters, that remains about the same. But what they do, since most weapons are a bit lighter when you're dealing with clan equipment, well, it comes with a clan ERPPC, which is a devastating long-range weapon, a pair of large pulse lasers, which clans will say is a, is a long-range weapon or even a medium-range weapon, because it doesn't fire as far as that ERPPC, but it still shoots really far, and a pair of clan ER medium lasers, which do give more punch as well. The six rack is still a standard six rack. It's not streak, but as clan equipment, it is much lighter. Any regular inner sphere commander out there would kill for a mech like this. This would be a centerpiece of a military engagement. But for the clans, this is considered a second line mech that you relegate to, you know, defense duty, garrison, or, uh, you know, suicidal advances. And that's what uh, makes some people really mad. In the end, the guillotine does exactly what it's supposed to do. It fights in the front, it flank enemies, and it helps the assault mechs get into position while also being able to command lighter cavalry units as the heavier anchor to it. Not so cheap enough and not advanced enough that it managed to survive the succession roll fairly well and ended up getting also really fantastic upgrade kits. As with most mechs, the end question remains. Can you afford it? Can you field it? For the guillotine, that's generally an answer that's answered with a yes with boat because it's not that expensive and all the equipment is off the rack. And when you get to a bit of a modern battlefield, even there, all the equipment that's in it is fairly straightforward. If I had a dime for every the number of time guillotines messed up operation I was a part of, I'd probably be able to repay some of the mechs that I lost to guillotines. So it is a mech that is fairly high on the recommended list. So I hope you guys have a very nice rest of your day. I thank you very much for listening to me today, and I will see you guys later. Bye-bye.